to the cloud. God bless. Um, so today we have an exciting topic. Um, um, well, they titled it Render Neutral Applications of Quantitative MRI Quality Control. I think they were trying to be very accurate and precise in what they talk about, but uh, 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 Nicola, Matthew, and Aga, and other, their lab mates are uh, really great champions of quality for some time, and they've been trying to solve uh, fundamental issues in this space for a while. I learned quite a lot from them over the years, and they also organized something called Emarathon. I think it's a fantastic thing that uh, you should look up and try and join. So the idea for me to invite them is to just basically um, educate us on generally what they think are important challenges in quantitative MRI. And in, in addition to talking about just challenges, I think uh, Matthew and Aga are going to like give you solutions too. I think so that's also pretty exciting. I think it's as important as just identifying challenges. So without further ado, I think, so Matthew, you're starting first, right? Yep. I'll share screen. Uh, yeah. So just a quick bio, uh, Dr. I don't think I'll pronounce his name right. Dr. Boudreau is a, is a uh, research, is, is that correct? Yeah. Uh, is, Dr. Um, um, Boudreau is a research fellow at the Montreal Heart Institute and a software developer for the Neuropoly, the Polytechnic Montreal. His expertise is in quantitative MRI techniques, such as V1, T1 mapping, and quantitative magnetization transfer imaging. He's also the uh, deputy editor for scientific outreach for the uh, Journal of uh, Magneti Magnetic Resonance in Medicine, and is currently the lead editor for the digital content of the MRI Highlights Initiative. So for me, what it speak the the way it speaks to me is not only they do this great important work but he's also found a very creative position in terms of being a software engineer as well as doing psychom and which nicola had been promoting quite a while in different initiatives including ohpm aperture so uh, fascinating i'm encouraging many people to pursue that direction too the last panel we had a couple of weeks ago was talking about that too. So this is fascinating to hear from Matt. Go ahead, Matthew. Thank you. Great. Uh, okay. Can everybody see my screen quickly? Yeah. So Great. how do you want it? Interactive or questions at the end? Or? Um, uh, maybe questions at the end because uh, I, Aga and I have not coordinated the time exactly. Um, so, uh, but uh, okay. I guess if there's, if there's a pressing question, f feel free to jump in, but, um, it, it's been rehearsed. Otherwise we can talk, talk about it at length at the end. Great. Well, uh, thank you very much for the invitation to speak today. Uh, like Pradeep was saying, um, my name is Matthew Woodrow and I'll be speaking along with Aga Karakuzu about some topics related to quantitative MRI, reproducibility, and uh, touching on quality control that we do um, in our lab. <clears throat> and so we've divided the talk into three parts. So I'll start off just giving you some introduction into quantitative MRI, T1 mapping, and our software that we uh, maintain in our lab. Then I'll hand it off to Aga, who um, is going to talk about uh, venture neutral standard to publication pipeline, which has been the centerpiece of his PhD work. And finally, I'll just touch on some uh, a topic relating to a reproducibility challenge that um, I led at the ISMRM conference uh, recently. So um, just starting off with a, a provocative statement, quantitative MRI has a reproducibility problem. Um, this is an issue because one of the hallmark promises that quantitative MRI uh, is trying to sell, especially to clinicians, is that quantitative MRI is supposed to be reproducible and robust uh, amongst different techniques, um, different sites, different uh, scanner vendors. And that's not what we see for a lot of techniques uh, in practice. And uh, quantitative MRI as a field is not new. Uh, you know, it's about as old as the field of MRI itself. Um, on the left here, I'm showing what I think is the first quantitative MRI map, which is a T1 map that was published um, just a few months after the first MR image. 
And on the right is the progress after 40 years or some high resolution uh, T1 maps in the brain. <laughs> You'll have to apologize. Um, I, I, I'm at the tail end of a cold, so I might have a few coughing fits. Um, so these are three different T1 mapping, um, or three different T1 maps uh, acquired with different uh, T1 techniques that we published uh, in a paper, me and Nicola, a few years ago. And we see that there's some disagreement uh, you know, in our experiments here. And so if we want to push this field further and have more you know, clinical applications and multi-center applica uh, multi studies, um, we need to find ways to improve the reproducibility uh, of quantitative MRI you know, as a field. And I think the response by the community has been uh, very proactive for the last uh, you know, decade or so. Um, here I'm just showing some example um, topics of things that um, the field has been mo moving towards to to, I think, try to improve reproducibility. One has been, uh, you know, the development of some quantitative imaging phantoms. Um, here I'm showing you one that is called the isomerum system phantom offered by Caliber MRI, which was developed uh, in collaboration with NIST. Um, there's also been a lot of push at um, sharing code, sharing data, and doing collaborative uh, code <coughs> or collaborative softwares. Um, to try to make, uh, you know, the analyses that we do a little bit more transparent. So one of the softwares is a software that we developed in our lab. Camera Lab, there's several others available in the community. So Quit um, by Tobias Wood, uh, HMRI, the group in Europe. Um, so those types of things. Um, also, there's been a lot of push at reproducibility on the acquisition side. And so that uh, touches on things like um, a paper by Junia, Recent, that was recent, recently published, which is a consensus paper for standard protocols. And also um, a lot of topics that Aga will talk about uh, on his part of the talk. Um, I think um, we'll mostly be talking about T1 mapping techniques as examples here. Um, that's because that's uh, been a focus in our lab uh, over the past couple of years. And also T1 is one of the more fundamental um, MR parameters. And so T1, if you're not aware, is just the, uh, it's a constant that characterizes the signal recovery or the amount of time that signal takes to recover in an MR experiment. My apologies for the coughing there. Um, on the left, um, <coughs> I'm showing some pulse sequence diagrams, if you're familiar with them, of two of the more popular um, T1 mapping techniques, inversion recovery and variable flip angle, or also known as dead spot one. Inversion recovery is known somewhat as, as, as a gold standard, but takes a significant amount of time at acquiring a whole volume. So it's not practical to do for 3D images. Variable flip angle is uh, very rapid. It's a steady state technique. So you, you can acquire 3D uh, images with it, but it depends on additional quantitative maps such as B1. On the right, I'm showing instead of some equations, I've decided to show some um, signal curves. And so on the top, it's the inversion recovery signal curve. Uh, so the longitudinal magnetization is flipped. And then in the experiment, we acquire data at different inversion times. And we can fit these models for and extract the T1 values. As you can see, the curves are very different for each T1 value. Um, variable flip angle is a steady state technique. So it has a short TR curve is different. It varies with the excitation flip angle. So here we sample for different excitation flip angles and then fit for T1. And you can see the different curves for that. Do you want to know more about quantitative T1 mapping? We developed uh, an interactive tutorial um, recently or the last couple of years that covers a lot of the material in depth. It has interactive figures. Um, it has um, the code that was used to generate the figures as well as some containerized environments so that you can you know, click on the launch binder button and uh, play with the code uh, in your browser without having to uh, install anything locally. So remove some barrier to access for this uh, material. Um, <clears throat> this tutorial was published as a chapter in a book last year. So the book is Quantitative Magnetic Resonance Imaging. Um, and our chapter was published with a Creative Commons license, which allows us to uh, continue to share the tutorial. So you can access the material in both of these ways. The book is really good for uh, exploring a lot of the quantitative MR techniques if you want to see the other ones. So when you're doing uh, you know, quantitative MR, I think it's really important um, um, 
to have a deep understanding of the models that you're using. And so this helps you not just plan your experiment, but debug your experiment if there's issues happening afterwards. Um, here, I'm just showing you uh, one of the interactive figures that I'll uh, animate shortly. Um, and this is two different signal curves for the inversion recovery experiment. So it's the magnitude because that you typically acquire magnitude data. Um, and uh, I just got a notification that you can see. Sorry, I got a notification from Zoom. Um, uh, sorry. So there's two different uh, signal curves. And one is the general equation without any approximations. And the other one is what's called the long tier approximation that's been widely used for inversion recovery experiments, but assumes that full recovery happens. And so within interactive figure, you can see that this is uh, both the equations are valid for short T1 values, but as uh, the T1 value that you might be sampling increases, the significant, significant deviation between the actual signal and what you might be fitting with the approximation. Um, and so being able to explore, uh, you know, the models themselves along with the data, um, all in the same environment is something that we think is important when you're doing quantitative MR. And that's why we've integrated a lot of tools, um, touching on this in our software, uh, Kilmer lab. Uh, if you've not seen our software, this is, uh, you know, a screenshot of the interface. It's a MATLAB uh, software here. It's a graphical user interface. And we offer a lot of, uh, you know, tools. So there's over 20 different quantitative MR models uh, that have similar features um, in the same interface and a lot of uh, tools to help you uh, debug your data or explore your data a little bit further, such as not just looking at the fitted T1 map that you can fit in this uh, environment, but looking at the raw data as well. Um, looking at the histograms and statistics, um, being able to click on a voxel and looking at the raw data of that voxel, as well as the fitted curve um, uh, produced by the model that you choose, chose to uh, fit the data. And so I think this can help to, to debug any issues if you have artifacts or if you have problems with um, you suspect you might have problems with your data. Um, if you do detect a problem, I think it's, or we think it's also important to have some uh, more simulation tools so that you can um, get more insights on how to maybe resolve it. Um, so we have a QMR simulator where uh, you can do things like uh, simulate a single voxel curve with preset, um, you know, parameters, protocol parameters and uh, um, like T1 values and constants. Um, we have things like since sensitivity analyses and a multi-voxel distribution. Um, so I just wanted to touch on essentially what I, I just presented. So quantitative MR, uh, reproducibility issues, T1 mapping, um, and our software. And now I'll hand it off to Aga for um, his part of the talk on his uh, PhD work. Um, maybe we can... Uh, have some questions before we move on. Oh, Feel sure. Free. Yeah, like audience. So I was curious what sort of um, challenges were discovered with the um, software, especially the simulations, you know? What do you mean by, <coughs> sorry, challenges? So my as I understand it, the software is helpful to basically uh, validate the data, so to say. Or... Um, yeah, so I mean, I think, I think each of us in the team has different views of how to use the software. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, I, and I think it depends on what stage you are in your, I wanna say, MR career. If you're just starting off, I think the quantitative or QMR lab is really great you know, learning tool if you're just learning about inversion recovery, it's great to go in there, take the simulator and, and look at how the parameters will change the signal, you know, just to learn. Um, if you're developing, uh, you know, maybe a, an imaging protocol, it's really useful to know maybe what are your limits or, for example, in inversion recovery, one thing that you typically want to avoid is acquiring, you know, a data point close to the signal lull because mm -hmm. signal null, because that's going to be weighted more by the noise. And so you can apply that uh, and, and you know, simulate, your, for example, your inversion times ahead of time to see you know, if we're acquiring in the brain, where is going to be my signal null and do I want to adjust my inversion times before I do the experiment? So as a more preventative measure, 
Um, and then finally, if you have data um, and you're like in the middle of your research, uh, but you, you see some kind of artifact or, or some errors, and I'll, I'll talk about that at my last part, um, you can, you know, plot the data with, at, you know, you can look at the image as a whole, but then you can click on the image on, uh, on a voxel and then simulate or not simulate, but look at the raw data along with the fitted data. And that'll give you insights on, uh, you know, maybe potential problems and if it's things that you can correct or not. Um, um, so that would be my view. I don't know if Nicola or Aga want to jump in on, I guess, their views of Curemar Lab um, and how to resolve issues. When I think, yeah, I you think, said you will touch upon it later again, right? So we can well, I'll give later. you an example of, of one. Um, hmm. So uh, yeah, I don't know if Nicholas is Aga. Did you want to jump in? Your Aga has yeah. been mostly the lead, um, I guess, uh, maintainer recently of Cumor Lab. Yeah, probably I'll have more more questions about that after my talk. Not I. I don't have much to add at this stage. Okay. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. Sure. So a quick intro to Aga. Um, I guess <laughs> I, I should not say Dr. Karakuzu, although I guess I mistook. He's already won. Um, yeah. So he's a PhD candidate at the uh, Nero Poly Lab under the doc, uh, supervision of Dr. Nicolas Tico. His uh, research focuses on bringing uh, QMRI applications under one umbrella through data standardization vendor neutral acquisitions and uh, fully transparent and reproducible workflows, as well as community building, which is like my main stick myself. <laughs> so, and he says his motivation for open science is born from a combination of um, open source development at BrainHack, Marathon, OpenMR, as well as uh, different science communications venues such as MRM highlights. OHPM blog and uh, OH ISMRM's MR Pulse. So this is fascinating work and I'm looking forward to learn. Uh, Aga, please take. Okay, thank you so much for the introduction, Pradeep. Okay, let me share my screen. Okay. I think you can see it, right? Yeah, but we can see uh, your taskbar at the bottom for some reason too. There we go. Okay, now now it should be better. Okay, so just to distract you a bit uh, from the technical details, I'd like to start my part with a story. And unlike many other stories we've been hearing about QC and quantitative MRI, I just didn't want to narrate a short drama. Instead, in this one, quality control is waiting in the same queue with quantitative MRI and eyeing it to guide it towards clinics. And this shared queue to clinics is really crowded since that's where most of the metas think they are headed to. But in general, publish and subscribe pattern is more popular for the sake of the journey. And if you did some network programming, I think you got the message. Anyway, in the end, without QC, direction to clinics are not clear for any of them. But fortunately, quantitative MRI and QC has already something in common. So it all starts with one letter, same Q, but it's a long journey for this couple to make it through. And to match make quantitative MRI with QC in this story, we need to lay out three ground rules. It's standardization, modularity, and good user, user experience to, uh, that actually fosters some familiarity with all these methods. And after we paved the way with these components by adding them to a good workflow of design, there are multiple steps that QMRI and QC must take hand in hand with so that they can reach the destination. So now we will take a look at a workflow that has all these components ingrained in its design that begins at the scanner center and extends all the way to publication because if quantitative MRI is to blaze a trail towards clinics, it must take many, many round trips between scanner and publication. Now I'll try introducing these workflows from both users and developers' perspective. It all starts with an acquisition. So someone has to write some code to derive the scanner. And in MRI, these programs are called pulse sequences. And for developers, creating pulse sequences requires familiarity with uh, usually a vendor-specific software development environment 
which is a big hurdle of generalizability. And as far as I know, they are not the most intuitive programming libraries at all. And on user's end, availability um, of that method depends on which brand of scanner they have and the version of the software running on that scanner. For example, after a vendor upgrade, that research sequence you've been working on for a while may not be usable at all. And this acquisition is followed by reconstruction. And here it's pretty much up to the developer developing that sequence, whether to use vendor native reconstruction engine or to create a data outlet that works nicely with open source alternatives. But overall, this kind of tailored integration happening at the scanner side has five stars of difficulty if vendor APIs are used. And this translates to a five stars difficulty in uh, user experience and gets even more complicated for multi-center studies. But at least beyond this point, once we cross the border of image domain, connecting the remaining steps becomes um, relatively easier. So there are many alternatives for quality control, pre and post processing, then maybe statistical analysis to publish your findings and then put some of them into a nice modern publishing object like Matthew showed us. And yeah, um, at the end of the day, you can stitch these together using, for example, a bash script or your favorite programming language to make calls to the operating system. And let's say this customized integration at the operating system level is a difficulty with a rank of three stars. Um, Reproducibility challenges, I guess, behind this border of image domain, image domain usually stem from technical roadblocks placed by proprietary implementations. And we see more and more examples, uh, I guess, in the last five, six years in the literature that they affect our findings in quantitative images. And most of the time, it's really difficult to think about QC for users at this level because their hands are tied. These things are mostly hidden. We don't know what's going on in the background. And reliability challenges beyond this border are mostly practical and analytical variability exists because of the differences in software implementations, versions, execution environments, and even operating systems. And if we'd like to achieve computational outputs we can, that we can repeat, reproduce, and generalize, we need a transparent provenance record at each step. And this is only possible if we can streamline the technical solutions behind this yellow border with the practical solutions beyond it. And with a particular interest in quantitative MRI pipelines, I aimed at streamlining all these steps in a standard way to create fully transparent workflows, hopefully with an integration difficulty of one star at any level of the pipeline. So as Matthew introduced, um, I am, I've been developing QMR Lab for a while and it operates at the processing level but it doesn't include modules for image reconstruction or registration, quality control. And I think it should not. Remember, we care about modularity. It's, it's one of the core values of QC and QMRI making it together to some point. So using community data standards and portable software technologies, we can take advantage of, um, for example, Nextflow data-driven pipeline engine and create fully reproducible QMR lab workflows. And this is why I developed QMR flow. It defines a workflow logic around QMR Lab, but gives users uh, flexibility to choose what they would like to use at each one of these steps without much hurdle. And why do we need a QMRI data standard then? Well, there are at least 13 more open source quantitative MRI applications. And here I'm not even count the number of tools that has QMRI as a sub module. So we cannot ignore the fact that there is a variability in our solutions as well and we cannot integrate all these tools into one big software, but we can make these tools speak at least the same input output language by developing a data standard. And this is why we developed a big, a big bits extension proposal to establish a universal data standard for interoperable data processing and for unified access to quantitative MRI data. So why not put everything from registration to post-processing in one place? Why do we care about modularity in a quantitative MRI workflow at all? 
because this way we can isolate each task in separate containers and connect them to each other using data standards. Um, I mean, I guess this also brings the benefit of decoupling process execution from pipeline management at the source level. It keeps your core software, your core code base cleaner without having to deal with a bunch of different uh, conditional managements. And here's an example. When the acquisition is completed here, the workflow kicks off automatically because Nextflow has a watchdog of a specific path. You can just dump your data there and it was, it's, it's waiting for a specific pattern and then starts the workflow execution and then converts the raw data to ISMRM raw data format and then calls Gadgetron, then converts your data into bits. Then your bits images are going into an, an alignment, for example, using Elastics, which is also running in a container. And then this converts, this creates another bits derivative which can be picked up by QMR lab to perform T1 fitting, for example, in vivo. So here, data flows uh, from one module into another, and you don't have to deal with share queues or data buffers, semantics of data conversion, directory management, execution logging, all of them are handled automatically by a third software observing the whole process. So, I guess in the end, we'd like to eliminate as much as human error as possible in these steps. And to do that, we need to eliminate humans from the loop. And this way, QMRI and QC can finally meet. We can now spend our time doing quality control instead of dealing with the specifics of the processing. And remember, QC and QMRI go hand in hand in every step of the way. And here's a QC example before processing. And this was a hackathon project uh, based on visual QC to do some quality check on magnetization transfer saturation data. Here we, say we have three sets of ionomical images and we like to quickly compare them to see if they give the contrast differences we expect, then we overlay them to see the magnitude of between scan motion using visual QC. And this is quality control after the fact. By default, our workflow exports uh, various reports for quality control. And this is an interactive workflow execution report automatically published on qmrlab.org for repositories uh, once the processing is completed because these reports are published in HTML format, which is really convenient. And here you can take a look at CPU and memory footprints of each process, see which containers were run, which, which command allocation, which logs were generated. And if you see something you don't like, you can use process hash codes to trace it back to a work directory where everything is stored. Then you can quickly check ROI stats summary, summary to see um, if the results make sense. If not, then you can take a look at bits QMR map metadata to see if there's something fishy with your data pickup or your acquisition parameters. And if you enable parcellation and alignment modules at the end of your workflow, you can just do it by changing a few lines you can plug visual QC once again and do sanity check. So it is modularity and standards that makes it easy to set these up for your quality control needs. So they almost made it. One last checkpoint, it's familiarity and user experience. And what do I mean by that? I think this Twitter conversation with Paradeep will answer that this was exactly two years ago and he asked if we could modify scanner graphical user interface to interact with scanner and to observe some events. And then Dr. Zimmerman mentioned uh, idea, it's Siemens SDK for sequence programming and reconstruction and noted that, okay, you can do some pulse sequencing reconstruction, but you cannot do much with GUI. And then some other comments about how horrible the whole code base actually is. And then Pradeep asked, okay, then why is every, everyone putting up with this? Isn't there a vendor agnostic API? And that's how you summon me on Twitter. Vendor neutral acquisitions and graphical user interfaces are possible. So the, traditionally, this is how MRI scanners are run. There are three major manufacturer, uh, manufacturers, and here I'm showing two of them, Siemens and GE. They have a proprietary workstation for each one of them on which pulse sequences are installed to drive these scanners for data collection. But what if we can bypass this vendor channels to collect data and have a powerful workstation on which QMR flow is installed with open source and vendor neutral pulse sequences? 
And for to achieve this solution, we are using Archihub real-time imaging platform. So these photos are from Toronto Sunnybrook, where they have one GE and one Siemens scanners. Vendor native GUIs are different for, from each other, of course. You cannot customize them or they run pulse sequences with closed source code. Whereas the simple laptop with Archihub can drive both scanners using one customizable GUI to run open source pulse sequences. And this is literally what we use to collect uh, some multi vendor data from two scanners uh, for an experiment. And this is our setup on CMS Skyra in Montreal. Uh, we have a powerful workstation instead of a laptop because we are doing some, it, it, it enables some real time high performance cardiac imaging. So you sit in front of this computer, you git clone a git repo, pull a few Docker containers, and you are ready to run the whole workflow with a click of a button. You get your quantitative MRI inputs and outputs all in bits format do your quality control and leave the scanner with a peace of mind, I guess. And if you're wonder wondering if it really works, because I would hear some compar comparisons between um, vendor native and vendor neutral acquisitions on tree scanners, these open cross marks indicate ISMR Omnist system phantom T1 reference values. Matthew will talk about them soon. And the native implementation of the first scanner overestimates the reference T1 values. Same goes for the second one, a bit overestimation. For the third one, again, an overestimation. But when the first scanner is run with our vendor neutral sequence, the measurement becomes more accurate. The same goes for the second scanner, also for the third scanner. So our results show up to 20% improvement in accuracy which is a considerable uh, variability to remove from our way, I guess. And in vivo, white matter distributions. Uh, so with, with these images, let me, let me show you. Yeah, here, for example, this is vendor native from GE. And the following two scans are from Siemens. And you can see that values are a bit higher uh, overall in this image as we see in Phantom. But when we compare three images between vendor neutral acquisitions of three different scanners, they are closer to each other. And when we look at the distribution, we see that this pattern is actually captured by these distributions. Vendor neutral histograms are closer to each other than the vendor native ones. And as these T1 distributions from different scanners nicely come together, so does our quantitative MRI and QC and hopefully they are happily ever after. So this is the part that I wanted to <laughs> present. OK, so now I'm going to hand it over to Matthew again. If you have some questions, I'm happy to answer them quickly, uh, or we can go back to them after Matthew is finished. That is a fabulous talk, um, Aga. It's wonderful. I love the um, artwork and the flow. And I should, I should look at the next floor. It looks like it's a very useful tool. Um, I, yeah. Any questions from the audience? So, I mean, I, this is a lot of hard work in my personal opinion. I think um, I, I, I didn't think that our conversation on that Twitter would come back here, but that's actually something that I'm actively thinking about even today, because one of the things I'm trying to do now is to enable quality control as they are acquiring the data. It's actually really hard. You need to work through these uh, lot of uh, barriers put up by the vendors to actually make that happen. Achieving that would actually solve a lot of problems in your imaging, but that may be another, I don't know, five, 10 years away, depending on uh, support. So. Now, if we have no questions, we can get to the next part. All right. I you you want to take yeah. over? Yeah, I'll start. <laughs> yeah, that was, uh, as always, a great talk by Aga. I don't know how to follow that up. It's like a cover band following up the Beatles. Um, but I'll present what I have. Um, so, uh, yeah, I just wanted to touch on about 10 minutes uh, reproducibility challenge that we did as part of the ISMRM conference uh, a few years ago. It was a joint collaboration between the reproducible research and quantitative MR study groups. 
And um, I really had fun doing this. Um, I, I think it's important and it, it really, um, you know, um, brought some additional insights, I, I guess, for me and some other people. Uh, as, as quantitative MR researchers or, or, or developers, we're often dealing with a smaller amount of data and at a single site. And this was a larger data set, a multi-site. Um, and uh, so that posed some additional um, challenges or insights um, along the way, and I'll share some. So our challenge pitch was, uh, will an imaging protocol that's independently implemented uh, by different groups at multiple centers uh, reliably measure T1 uh, using inversion recovery in the NIST FATM, essentially? The protocol that we used was the one published in Joel Burrell's 2010 paper on T1 mapping. Um, it has a few peculiarities. So one is that it has a short repetition time relative to traditional uh, T inversion recovery T1 mapping techniques. Um, this wouldn't be an appropriate protocol. For example, the, uh, the long TR approximation that I gave in my animation earlier, but um, with the uh, fitting model that Joel developed is an appropriate model. Uh, also, the inversion times range from 50 milliseconds to 2,500 milliseconds. The NIST Phantom has T1 values that range from about 25 milliseconds to uh, 2,000 milliseconds. And so these inversion times were optimized essentially for T1 values inside the brain. And so we know that ahead of time, uh, we likely won't get good results for the entire range of you know, 14 NIST spheres. Um, so it's just something else to keep in mind. Um, we, we had, you know, open science uh, in our thoughts throughout this challenge, and so we really wanted to make this collaborative, open, and so the entire submission process was done through GitHub, uh, through GitHub issues where we would discuss uh, throughout the submissions. Um, the T1 fitting pipeline that was used as one of the steps there um, is also published, all the code there, all the analysis tools, Jupyter Notebooks, uh, everything you need is published here. We also have you know, the NIST data that's uh, uploaded on uh, OSF and linked, um, I think somewhere here as well. In total, we received 19 submissions uh, or submissions from 19 different groups uh, of researchers. Um, that totaled 41 T1 data sets in the Phantom and about 56 uh, people, uh, uh, subjects in humans that the group submitted. Uh, all but one was on, at 3T and uh, they uh, spanned three of the major vendors. Uh, to give you a, a you know, better view of you know, what are the relationship between the data sets that were acquired, this is a dashboard that Aga developed. I think you can see style here. Um, and you can see the flow of you know, what type of data was acquired um, at which sites and using which vendors. And this dashboard is a grid. Um, I'll share a link in the next slide. If you click on Phantom or Brain, you get additional information, a lot of statistics, a lot of data um, that was collected during this challenge here. So like uh, the mean values across all sites um, for, for all sites, coefficient of variations, temperatures that uh, the scans were done at, for example, um, uh, T1 values for specific spheres across all the sites. Um, and the same for the human data as well. And so this is, um, yeah, if, you, if you're interested in, in exploring a little bit of the data sets interactively, this is a great way to do it. Um, and so this is still a work in progress, I, even though it's been a little bit of a while. Um, here, I'm just, I just wanted to show you some of the raw T1 maps. So before they're registered, before we segment out the ROIs, um, just to give you an idea of the heterogeneity of uh, the data sets that we received. And so there's uh, variations between, you know, orientations, um, field of views, acquisition patterns, um, some artifacts. Um, but overall, the important thing is that uh, if the technique is robust and the phantom is good, um, and these are all, almost all different phantoms, by the way, um, then the values inside the spheres should be consistent across the measurements. Um, link below are just the scripts that were used to generate this figure. And during the submission process, we had to do some quality control to make sure that people were submitting, uh, you know, not just with the proper information, but that the data sets didn't have any, you know, major errors. One of the ways that we did this, it was helpful with the spheres to look at 
Um, if there was any, you know, irregular patterns in the values uh, of the spheres. And so like the errors relative to the reference values, for example, one data set had, um, you know, really strong errors for certain spheres and then almost accurate for other spheres. And um, we had to dig into why um, to see if it, if it was like a, something that was correctable or not prior to accepting the data set. Uh, turns out that this user, there was an option on this on their scanner vendor where they could export the data that was normalized um, for each of the images. And so um, this is, was not an appropriate option to choose uh, to do quantitative MR because you want the actual values and not normalized values. Um, but thankfully the uh, scanner vendor offers a, a software to uh, revert the data into the proper um, uh, format. Um, just for a different view, this this same error was done by a couple of users also on uh, when that scanned uh, human data. Um, and so on top, you can see the differences that you would have seen if you would have acquired, uh, you know, the inversion recovery maps um, with this option on. Um, so the wide range of value or the wide difference in values in the uh, white matter are clearly evident. And then um, by applying the correction uh, prior to accepting the results, uh, you see that the uh, data is uh, much more standardized compared to the other measurements that were done. Uh, so once we collected all these submissions, we started doing the analyses. And so this included, you know, plotting the T1, the mean T1 values against the reference values. Um, at this point, we noticed that there were still, you know, some peculiar, um, um, you know, features such as really, really large error bars for some of the data sets. Um, looking at the data visually, we were able to determine that um, our uh, registration pipeline and we had a template ROIs that we used as well were touching some of the uh, boundaries of the, <coughs> of the NIST sphere. And so these had to be then manually corrected. And so we applied that um, feature as well. And so with the data corrected, um, this was our main uh, initial uh, you know, result. Um, so here I'm showing the mean T1 values for each of the 41 uh, measurements um, plotted against the reference T1 provided by the uh, scanner manufacturer for each of the uh, 14 spheres. Um, and uh, I'm plotting it with linear axes on the left and log log axes on the right. Uh, looking at the linear axes, we can see that you know for the range in T1 value uh, of T1 values, it, that would be observed in humans, so 500 to 2,000. There's fairly good agreement. It lies around that reference line. And then by looking at the log log axis, we can see that this you know, breaks down significantly um, for uh, the lower end of T1 values or the, the spheres that were of very low T1 values. And this comes back to the point where um, I, I mentioned at the beginning that we would expect this to happen because the imaging protocol was not optimized for this range of, uh, you know, uh, T1 values are so from 20 milliseconds to about uh, 200, 300 milliseconds. Um, we can plot again the same data, but in terms of reference, uh, in terms of errors, so the difference between what we had measured and the reference T1, and we see that most of the measurements lie within the you know plus or minus 10% uh, errors, but there's still a few outliers. Uh, so about three sites, I think, out of the 41 that within the human range. Um, have values that lie significantly outside. And it's still an open question on, uh, you know, what potential um, implementation error that they might've had, or if it's a, a measurement error. Um, so we haven't solved that um, yet or found a, a potential explanation for these sites yet. And so this is the gist of it. I just wanted to, you know, give you a brief introduction of our brief overview of uh, some of the results that we had for this challenge and some of the challenges that we encountered. Um, we had a lot of participants. So these are the ones that submitted NIST phantom data. These are the ones that uh, submitted human data. Um, we had a lot of collaborators and contributors. Um, uh, so the study groups, uh, people that contributed uh, specific pieces of code like Gina Cohen died for registration and the uh, phantom ROI templates of Citrinus at Andrew at NIST. Um, Aga for the dashboard and other people for discussions. And then um, since this is the end of, I guess, our whole talk, um, just thank you for everybody at Notapuddy. Um, I think because of COVID, we haven't had a, a, a up-to-date figure, but uh, photo together. So we'll have to try to do that, I think, soon. But so thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Matthew. Um, any questions from the audience? I see some thread going on in the chat, maybe. Uh, Iwa can 
pick it up here if she wants to. Yeah, well, I was just asking Aga about the the potential differences in the implementations for the vendor sequences that might be the source of the differences that you're measuring relative to the vendor neutral sequence. And it would be interesting to try to figure out what that is. I think Aga has some, some strong suspicions of what the differences are. Yeah. Um, but if some work could be done there to really pinpoint what the differences are and then inform the vendors, that would uh, probably be really helpful for the QMR community at large. Yeah. I mean, how about getting them out of the way, you know? <laughs> getting them out of the way? <laughs> yeah, well, I understand, I understand that that's what Aga's mission is, and it's a good one, yeah. but they probably won't be entirely gotten out of the way um, <laughs> everywhere in the world. I mean, if uh, these vendor-neutral approaches take off, that would be awesome, but I think some people in no, some I think we should still going to be it. using... Uh, yeah, we should push TV. for it, you know? What are the challenges in going in the direction, Aga? Yeah, I, what, what in Eva said, I guess the key word is potential differences because you really kind of need to reverse engineer with some other tool that you can run the exact same hardware with a different kind of approach and play with the parameters and try to estimate. It's, it's, a, it's actually guesstimation, I guess, not even an estimation, then to see what would be the differences because no matter what you do, you won't be able to, I guess, exactly see and follow the source code from the vendor. It's much more uh, complicated than what I can give you with the with all the, how can I say, the, the software components that you can relate to the quantification of the T1. So it's much easier to follow. So I, even if I have some ideas about what could be driving those differences, unless I have all the details from both GE and both Siemens, then compared to my sequence, it won't be able to possible. And as for uh, pushing vendors in any direction, I, I'm not sure if it's even possible. I mean, we, we have this memory with Nicola in, in a cardiac T1 mapping session where one of the Siemens representatives were actually called out for you know the differences between these uh, mapping methods and they they just said that there, there are some experimental constant for example they introduced to the sequence they are multiplying things for example by 0.8 to shift things to the right value or using some magic numbers so we don't know the best thing i think we can do i mean archihawk is not a full fully uh, free software it's a proprietary runtime but what i care about is to have access to all the details about pulse sequence implementations uh, as we have like a source code in MATLAB. Even if we don't care about the inner workings of Python or MATLAB, we can run our own thing and communicate at that high level uh, about what these differences would be. If I were vendors, if they are not willing to uh, push any of these solutions, they cannot probably promote Pulsate or RTHOP one, one over another. Uh, maybe they will just let it go for quantitative MRI and let people do their work. Then they're, they're also cool <laughs> we, because they will never reach a consensus, I guess, in just for some researchers to get T1 maps um, for their experiments. I don't know. Well, I, I think, I don't know what your thoughts on this, but I think vendors. I think they are interested in quantitative MRI because, you know, it is an additional tool, but I don't know how important it is for them to have, you know, cross, you know, cross vendor reproducibility. Um, you know, I, I know like certain vendors have, I don't know if there's a specific name, but like the MR fingerprinting, you know, which promises, you know, some quanti quantitative parameters, you know, at the scanner, you know, in five minutes, that's kind of black box in, on its own. But um, at least with that app, I think, you know, across every Siemens scanner, uh, for example, or every Philips scanner, whoever has that that app, then at least it'll be reproducible. You know, if you do a study across all of those same vendors. But um, mm -hmm. so, I mean, I have some thoughts on how I think we can push the vendors. I think researchers have more power than they realize if they get together. But there's a hand raised from Nicholas Lab, Alexandru, or whoever in the room. Go ahead. Yeah, um, just wanted to say um, thank you for, for those beautiful presentations, Mathieu and Aga, and uh, congratulations. This is really amazing work. And uh, 
So you know that uh, I find it an amazing work, so I can play the devil's advocate now. Um, <laughs> and I guess, uh, so I guess this is more for a question for, for Aga, you know, like you, you presented this as a way, you know, like it, it seems like it's a click of a button to, to get those, those maps, but, but we, we know it's not, you know, you, you spent like years doing that and you, you built an amazing expertise across, you know, Shell, Python, MATLAB, different ecosystems uh, of OSs and, you know, Elastics and, and maybe ANS, PMR Lab, PMR Flow. So if you ask a clinician to, you know, to use that pipeline, you know, that clinician won't be able to do that like uh, in, in two days. Uh, it's just impossible. Mm -hmm. So how do you like, so now if you, if you think of, you know, translating that across uh, and, and disseminating that, that, uh, that ecosystem, um, around different sites um i guess I, I'm, I'm just wondering how how we could make this happen because you know everybody won't do like empty set of the brain with the same um with the same orientation you know people do research so they want to prototype they want to acquire images of i don't know the brain the the heart the spinal cord they want to they want to focus on like the you know the, the occipital lobe for example so they will they want they will want to customize their their workflow and the customization could happen at different steps of the pipeline, meaning that they will need to understand, they will need to put their hands inside a particular step. And in order to do that, they will need to understand, you know, how an extra work. Uh, and um, so how do you envision we can make this happen? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so first, uh, at least at the acquisition side, right? It is granted that data is going to be exported in bits, uh, no matter which quantitative MRI acquisition you'd like to perform using one of our pulse sequences. And then on top of that, you can, of course, change some of the uh, acquisition parameters, less prescriptions, whatever. That graphical user interface gives full control to change whatever you like. And if there are some critical parameters for different use cases, for example, you'd like to change the MT pulse offset frequency, we can easily develop that into that graphical user interface as well. So on the uh, acquisition side, we can modify things with some information on how RTHOP works. But after the, the workflow components that follows after that, um, I am creating these. So there is an input and output logic, right? I am using Elastics, for example, to align images between different modules, but someone else would like to use a different software or they'd like to change to which reference image they'd like to align their other images. As long as we keep that input and output logic the same, which is provided by bits and some derivatives descriptions, we can go into that next flow code and just change the script part. So we don't have to create these things from the scratch. I think that's one of the advantages. We can modify either prime, if you like to do it at the parameter level, it's just a configuration file. If you'd like to add a new module, it's just changing a script. As long as these things are living in a container or they are installed in local machine, doesn't matter. Next flow can automatically work uh, either way. But of course, we won't ask users to do this. We may need to provide some support till we can really reduce it down to the level of a click of a button. Right now, it's like that for this particular use case. Uh, and my hope is that we are going to have more interest. People like to use this for different use cases, and then we will just tweak it and find even more uh, practical solutions to make it a bit more um, scalable or adjustable for different use cases. But overall, what I'm saying is that I am not taking a customized approach. And it really counts on Nextflow. But maybe if Nextflow stops supporting it, it's Snake or some other really low-level professional uh, data-driven workflow manager. I think that's what we need to connect these things. Because custom scripts, a custom bash script, or a custom MATLAB or Python script trying to crawl through directories finding dependencies and such are it's, it's just too complicated to manage so as long as it's easier for us to manage those things it should be easier for us to tweak things for different use cases mm -hmm. yeah no, thank you i mean i i guess Pradeep, you, you mentioned you wanted to look into next flow uh, i i did try to look into next flow 
uh, uh, I wanted to jump out of the window afterwards uh, because I, I didn't have the, the, the patience to, to, to basically go through this. It's just like a new ecosystem and, you know, not everybody will, will have, you know, as much patience as, as you had, Aga. Uh, that, that's the <laughs> concern there. So um, is it like um, Airflow or Snake Make? Is this a pipeline management thing, is it, Aga? Yeah, it's, it's a pipeline manager. Uh, and of course, Julian, I completely agree with that. It's a domain-specific language, and only a few people should poison themselves with that. I mean, we should create modules and just other people to just change a configuration file or the parameters that they care about to let the workflow run. And I am setting up all those conditions. But the important thing is that I am not doing this in MATLAB uh, or in QMR lab. Otherwise, things get really if I try to centralize all those things, then I lose my modularity, then I lose my flexibility. And that's why I like to use it on Nextflow. And again, my favorite thing about Nextflow that it provides and many other uh, workflow engines doesn't provide is that you can map each process into one container and it's clean. It's, it's a really important approach. I guess many of the services, that's how that uh, dashboard is running, for example, different services talking to each other with a data language. So it's kind of- Yeah, really I mean, yeah, yeah, sorry. my interest was more into uh, finding things that make it easy to interface with the scanner software, because mm -hmm. I think that's something I don't, haven't seen much outside uh, your yeah. work. I want to do it. And uh, so going back to the question now, um, the, uh, um, question about can we push the vendors out of our way i would like to push them out of our way as much as possible i think i was thinking as i was discussing various things you mentioned is how about if we make it uh, an ih or say a charles policy that vendors are supposed to produce data against some reference standards when they when they take payments from uh, public funding like you know, when when purchasing new scanners, they think that's where we can lay down some conditions in terms of hey, if you are selling as MR scanner for these applications, we you, we want you to be able to produce uh, certain expected uh, data against known phantoms, for example, right? That's one way to achieve harmonization, if I can use the word loosely, right? Is that as from my understanding, you're saying that is not possible today. Is that right? Uh, I think vendors are partially are aware of these issue, mostly because more people like to do AI things happening at the reconstruction level. For example, I know that Siemens is, for uh, for example, uh, making it much easier to consume some raw data from the scanner to plug it into different applications through a socket. They are kind of programming these things, so. It also has started changing partially because I think uh, it's also easier for vendors to just provide it and let people do whatever they like to do at some safe levels, as long as you don't want to run the scanner with something else, I guess. So that's the, that's the interesting part. If, if they are interested in doing that, why don't they give us access to the uh, scanning interface or at least the visualization interface, if not the scanning? You want to yeah, well, Pradeep, you raised a really good point that vendors are actually held to certain standards for when they when they sell machines, they have to have like a, a minimum image resolution, minimum contrast to noise ratio. Um, all those things have to meet a certain minimum sta QC standards that are published in, I don't know, medical physics journals. But they don't include anything for quantitative metrics that the type that we use. And I wonder what, like, maybe that's our, our responsibility to, to have those published within the medical physics guidelines. No, so just to elaborate my interest to get these people to do what we want is to hit them where it hurts the most, money. You know, basically like they, are, they have to sell scanners to us at the end of the day. I mean, if not today, like, you know, most of the scanners are, I don't know actually the distribution between uh, the amount of money coming from academic researchers and the clinics, but I don't think we are like negligible part of the pie. 
So the my interest is basically say going to NIH, CHR, and SREC or whatever. Say, hey, we need these from the vendors. The only way for us to achieve it is uh, achieve access to, for example, visualization interface as well as uh, other harmonization is to get them to do these few things that are not only in our interest, but also their interest. They just been, uh, they just haven't been doing it because there is no financial motivation for them to do it. Does it make sense? Do you guys follow me? Yeah, I mean, I, I can say a few words on that. Um, uh -huh. So, for example, we was talking to, to Siemens like a couple of years ago, and I was inquiring whether it's possible to plug some, you know, like third-party software and use their visualization system. And, you know, they, they went on saying that they are developing um, um, a way to do that, but it's, it's a proprietary um, um, layer. You know, in order to be able to plug that. And then Philips is doing the same and G uh, are doing the same because at the end of the day, as you said, uh, you know, the, um, they want to sell their, their model, but they also want to sell, they want to sell their model and not the, their, 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 com their competitors. So th they will always be in competition. So they will always need to, to have some proprietary layer that that they think is, is better done than their competitor. I'm not following. Um, so um, so if, the, the, so here is a quick uh, what you call a rebuttal. If there was enough competition, why are they not giving us more flexibility and access? For example, like even to get to um, what you call minus one layer in Siemens, I think we need something called the master research agreement as I understand it, which not which most imaging centers don't have. So I would like to see that like a default option in a way, for example, to make the vendor neutral acquisition a reality, so to say, to improve harmonization. So you see where I'm coming from? Yeah, but but I guess one one important thing at that stage is that if they open up to everyone without really a service agreement or something like that, I can also see from the vendor's perspective that why they don't like to allow something like that because there's hardware safety at the end of the day, there's patient safety, and if they cannot uh, somehow ensure that the the application is going to follow those regulations, but both for the specific hardware and patient safety, I can see that why they may not be willing to open it up as a default thing. Not, not just safety. Oh, sorry. I'll let you see after, but, um, but just like quality, yeah, you know, quality control, but in terms of their view, like, you know, if you give the user too many options in terms of like creating these pulse sequences, there's a likelihood that they misuse the options and then, you know, publish like say, so and so from this vendor gives a bad gives a bad image, and so I think they constrict a lot of the options so that you know any image that comes out looks really nice, um, and giving too many options can you know can be liable give them a liability in terms of uh, you know the view of the audience. But I mean, I feel like uh, it is possible to meet safety standards while still having flexibility to choose different parameters within approved ranges. I mean, one of the things I would like to do is just improve the visualization interface as the data gets acquired. I has, does not affect patient safety at all, right? So I think I, I, we, we, I would like to push in that direction. And um, they need to provide, I think, deeper access to the data. They may be doing that already, but I don't know why it hasn't happened so far after uh, what, 40 years, as you say, of MR acquisition so far. Yeah. So, so I, I mean, I think one element of, of answer is that uh, like if, you know, with, with, the, with the RT Hawk approach that I got presented, um, you know, the result is that we can get the same values or like similar values across vendors. So why would I pay $1 million more to get a Siemens if I could get a G for you know, $1,000 less, $1 million less. Um, you know, Siemens won't like that, right? And why would I like to get to buy a Siemens as opposed to a GE? Because uh, I, know, uh, I know that the hardware is different and I know that GE 
I, I, I hope there is no G people in there and that, that I'm going to offend, but you know, I, they, they tend to overuse like some, some filters to make the, the images nicer. Um, and that, that's how they, they sell their stuff. Um, so if, if we tell them to open uh, the, the layer and, and enable researchers to basically uh, show uh, how an, an actual image uh, without filters is being acquired and how it looks like, they, they won't like that. Um, if, if, if I was, you know, if I was in the, in, the, in the situation, I would probably not let this happen. Well, isn't Siemens much more popular than GE anyway already, as I understand it? I, I don't know the data, but I think Siemens is much more popular, at least in the neuro world. Yeah. Um, it's I mean, our, our scanners, I think we have like six scanners, they're all Siemens. Um, Yeah, I think, yeah, you're right. You are. I mean, hospitals and clinics is a very different environment, but I mean, it's interesting for me that the MR physics folks haven't pushed for deeper access to these scanners. You know, I thought these people would love to fiddle with all the hardware and scanners. So uh, I don't know. These guidelines are written by MR physicists who don't typically do research in QMR. Uh, we're, we're pretty yeah. isolated. So us QMR folks are doing all our research. We don't really have a very big role in MRI scanners and their acceptance in clinics and sort of setting the standards for how they're used in clinics. Um, so I think it's there's there's a potential there for opening some channels of communication and and helping raise the standard for what's included in these documents when it comes to QMR lab. Um, with, when it comes to QMR. And that's where the financial push could be because, and these documents are revised every 15, 20 years. So if there's a little bit more communication between the QMR um, research community and the medical physicists that revise these documents every decade or two, um, then next time that they're revised, if the standards are raised, hospitals have to follow these documents for accepting when they accept a new scanner and when they, when they test the scanner yearly, monthly, and daily, and if those are the new standards, then the vendors have to meet those standards. Yeah, yeah, I would love to be involved in that. In if you guys are going to pursue it, because um, I think that um, <coughs> academics. I mean, it's also a question of ownership. Hey, Nicola, I don't know. Have you been listening in? We are ask, We're trying to um, ask questions of can we push vendors to do what we want in terms of giving us deeper access uh, software uh, and other layers right so it's a, it's also a question of uh, ownership for me you know do we want the scanner or not is that question you know like if i buy a camera a dslr and you know mr scanner is mr camera in a way you know okay. I can't hear you, Nicola. I don't know if you are trying to say something. I think he's. Uh, I think a student in this class is speaking to him. Okay, okay, yeah. okay. Yeah. So I mean, it's a question of ownership. You know, like if we own the scanner, we should be able to do stuff as long as we keep it legal and safe for patients and whatnot, right? So I think that that also needs to be pushed in the community in the sense of you know we're paying a lot of money for these people. The scanners and we need uh, better for many reasons. For example, these big uh, data sets that are being uh, acquired across uh, US and Canada or whatnot, harmonization could be improved with better access to what goes on in the scanners, right? I don't know why MR physics people haven't achieved it, to be honest. Like Eva said, it may be that these old people not doing research have written rules 20 years ago. This time the, the younger generation takes over, you know. To, to, to throw more, more oil uh, on the fire, um, you know, <laughs> looking at the slides that Mathieu presented with the result of the, um, of the T1 mapping uh, challenge where, you know, each participant was asked to use the, the, the same sequence. So, you know, Mathieu, you were talking about the outliers, you know, at the, at, the, um, at the small T1 values, but we could also make the point that with, with like the, the T1 values in the, in the brain range, like, you know, like 1,000, like around 1,000 milliseconds, um, 
this was within like a 10% error. And I, I think many people would, would, would um, like looking at very subtle changes uh, due to pathologies that could be in the range of like 1%, then that, that's just not acceptable. Um, and I think that's, you know, I hear many times that, you know, we are obsessed with accuracy, uh, but precision is also extremely important. Uh, we, we tend to forget that and pro pragmatic clinician want also precision. And maybe that's, that's why they are not buying, uh, you know, all, all the things we're talking about. Uh, one, one thing I just wanted to, you know, um, th thanks for pointing on that, uh, making that point um, was that we, we weren't trying to specifically say this is, you know, the ideal protocol. You should be using this protocol. This was more from, I, I think, from an MR physicist side. We wanted to know, you know, if, if, you know, Eva publishes a paper and describes her method, we know the community is going to try to re-implement that method. Like, what, what's the error that we can expect from, you know, people trying to use that method there? Now, if you wanted, like, the, you know, a really good T1, you know, mapping uh, method, you know, I'm sorry if it, it led to some confusion, then, uh, you know, the NIST Phantom and uh, or the NIST group provided, you know, their recommendation for the optimal protocols to test this Phantom on. It wasn't what we asked our community to do. And so that requires a lot more measurements. It takes a lot more time, but um, so that should provide better results, right? Um, I mean, of course, if we, if we spend yeah. two hours acquiring on a, on a Phantom that does not breathe and move. Uh, yeah. Like, like, I mean, I guess a, a corollary question for, you know, what I got presented and, you know, what would be the next step of disseminating the, those technologies is uh, we have, a, we have a, a set up like an, an infrastructure and a, and a software ecosystem to, to uh, reproduce uh, pulse sequence and parameters and analysis pipeline. But now what sequence should we use and what sequence should we recommend? You know, how many inversion time, what, that's that's should that be our responsibility and and if so where where where, where should we go yeah i mean what i have in mind for the next steps is that first if possible collect more subjects because i i've seen like i recently collected data from two more subjects and how the agreement changes between for example even within the same vendor, vendor CMS, Sky versus Prisma, it also has a dependency for the subject, maybe just because I don't have a B1 map whatsoever. So first, I'd like to collect more data. And then my second goal is to maybe add one more metric to the mix by converting this NTSAT to an NPM protocol, and then run another multi-center study if we are lucky with both healthy and health, healthy participants and MS patients, just to explore it a bit to see the limitations uh, of this, both accuracy and precision, if it's going to reproduce uh, with different use cases. Uh, that's, that's what I'd like to explore first before I can have a more, uh, I guess, sound answer to that question. Because in the meantime, Juan, for example, our new, I guess, uh, member, new lab member, will be working on an MWF module so that we can also see how it plays out with uh, different scanners on RTHawk. What, what would you do, Julian? Which, which protocol would, you, would be your uh, go-to option if you were to standardize it across the world? Uh, I, I don't have the answer to that. And I, I think it's very difficult because um, people, you know, some will be okay having a protocol that, that lasts for like six minutes and some would prefer five minutes. And when you start changing that, you're, you're not under standards anymore. And I think it's, it's, it's extremely difficult. Uh, so I, I don't know. I mean, like every vendor do propose like um, on a set uh, in their, you know, like you know, cements dot, pro, uh, dot product, you know, they have like, a, like, you know, oncology, tumor, you know, brain, MS. They, they have some like already made protocol. So I guess the idea would, would be to have an already made protocols for specific applications. Maybe th that could be one avenue. Cool. Yeah, and I also like the. I, I also need to accelerate these acquisitions. Of course, by the way, the the ones that I'm showing from my results, there is no parallel acceleration whatsoever. So that's 
that's also another important thing if we think that people are going to use this because you cannot make people sit in the scanner for 20 minutes and give them half brain coverage so it's it's also another important next step for me to achieve yeah and maybe if i like another i mean there's like a, a lot of um, um like arguments to the question you know what is the ideal protocol um and the answer is modulated by what we want to achieve, uh, because if you want to achieve like um, you know better like ideal accuracy and precision across different hardware, then you need to consider noise like signal to noise ratio, because across vendors you won't have the same receive coils, and receive coil has an impact on the on, on the on the SNR. And if the if a particular fitting method or acquisition method for QMR sequence um, is more or less like is is very sensitive to noise, that will be a problem. Right? So this needs to be considered, and first we need to sit down and and, and decide on what are we, what do we agree to. Um, um, yeah, what, what what's our limit for for each criteria? Cool. Um, any other questions from the audience? I've seen I see some really quiet ones. I guess. <laughs> um, I actually have one question for all of you. I guess. Yeah. Um, yeah, and Aga showed a few screenshots of the hackathon project we did back at the Amarathon in terms of the visual QC. I was curious if uh, there is more we can do in terms of like data is already acquired, what sort of QC people should do before they analyze the data. You know, is has there been more discussion on that recently? I mean, are there standards slash protocols for that? Uh, like for example, we have this, and we have a data set in bids format that you guys help develop. How do we go about QCing it? I guess for different methods, we can come up with different QC uh, protocols. That'd be really cool. For example, for a multi echo data, uh, if a QC module can automatically read the outputs and just create an interactive figure for me to hover over the images to see how signal decays in each one of those voxels. There'll be a cool, for example, quick QC inspection for a data set. Uh, for, so of course here in between scan motion is not going to be much of an issue, but there are some other uh, protocols as in the, 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 the one I present because there are, there are actually separate acquisitions happening one after another. And there we'd like to see if there is really critical between scan motions, if there is ghosting motion artifacts and those kind of things for different types of contrasts. Uh, that's, I guess that may be the tricky part because when I take a look at the visual QC modules for the neuroimaging uh, for, for when, when you say anatomical image, it's always a nice high resolution T1 weighted image but for quantitative MRI data, it's not always the case. We have different kinds of contrasts and uh, those solutions may not directly apply to, to do a quality control check on different contrasts, for example. So maybe both adaptive for different types of acquisitions and different contrasts to be able to capture any ghosting artifacts and those kinds of things uh, QC frameworks can uh, perform. So what do people do today, like the researchers, active researchers in the QMR space, when, once they acquire the data? Are the, is the QC happening as they are acquired, or do they do anything on like open data sets, for example? I'm curious, you know? For example, like when you look at an anatomical image, there is like clear, uh, what you call, patterns and manuals about how to look for various types of artifacts, you know, be susceptibility, motion, RF interference, ghosting, saturation, whatnot, you know. I'm trying to think if there is such a manual. I don't so think there's say, any but... like checklists for that. Um, yeah. mean, different techniques, you know, you'll have different intuition as an MR physicist, but, um, you know, for example, quantitative MT, you know that, you know, at long off resonance, like the signal should be approximately what it is with the MT off. And so often we'll do like those types of checks, but um, yeah, I think like 
developing those standard like checklist QCs for different techniques would be um, valuable. Um, there's probably different insights from different groups as well. Sorry, sorry if I'm jumping in and you've only spoken about this. As you saw, like I, I finished my class, but students had questions, so I couldn't participate sooner. Um, I think the one of the mm, I don't know, misconceptions is that there is like a 20% solution to quantitative MRI that's going to cover 80% of the problems. And when we were approached for bids, that was kind of like, well, you just give me the sequence that covers 80% of quantitative MRI. It's such a fragmented field that I don't think any kind of consensus statement on quantitative MRI would ever do anybody any good. There have been efforts, you know, like Kiba, the, uh, the Quantitative Imaging Biomarker Alliance has some guidelines. And there are certain things such as, you know, don't use coefficient of variance or, you know, like some things that can apply to many numbers. Statistics yeah. is the one thing that's really missing. FMRI did statistics and then they realized they did it wrong and they fixed it. <laughs> we don't even do statistics or we don't know how to do statistics. So I think that would be a level at which we can attack it. But otherwise, there's no point in ha having this consensus statement of quantitative MRI in the liver and the heart. <laughs> which is what they just did, the quantitative MRI study, study group of ISMRM. No, I mean, it's a completely different beast. And heart is broken and liver isn't broken. So you can't put them both in the same place. So I think it really needs to be in separate kind of, if you want to do magnetization transfer in heart, these are the issues. But if you want to do the statistics, better do the same statistics. And I think that's the level at which I really want to attack the field. And our meta-analysis on myelin address some of these issues. Some of the work AGA does addresses these issues of statistics but we don't have statisticians in the field. Tom Nichols is on board. So we're doing this myelin imaging study. I don't know, the people in my lab should also kind of be aware of that because we want to do statistics for myelin imaging because we did a meta-analysis for myelin imaging. And then just take that framework and apply it to other kinds of quantitative MRI maps. And we should use, we could really use more statisticians on board. We are all engineers, physicists, modeling 23 parameters and talking about the sensitivity and specificity of our model. Of our model. We, we need something that's more meta and that statistics is that. Right, so yeah, I mean, I think that's the important, it's one important dimension, right? So that sounds like validating the, uh, what you call uh, properties you derive from the acquisition, right? Am I right? So my question was more about, you have some reasonable validation of well understood modalities of QMRI, I, I understand that there's many of them, but let's say for the top three or four, however you define them, is there a way to like it's acquired, it is shared openly on open euro or whatever. And then when I, before I use it, I wanna take a look at and make sure it's acceptable mm -hmm. for analysis. So what would you do when you look at it? That's the kind of question I have, you know? Just a second, sorry, uh, uh, the student, uh, Sophia, wait a bit, uh, I'll, I can talk to you. Uh, so bottom line, I don't think there is. Bids would be one way to really at least bring it in the same format. <laughs> and I mean, I'm happy. I would love to hear what other people uh, in the office and Naga and Matthew have to say about that. But I'm not aware of proper kind of, you know, quality control for quantitative MRI. Right. It's very interesting. I think, um, yeah, it's a, that's a good opportunity in my personal opinion. You know, I would be happy to work towards developing something like that in the informatic sense, but it, it does not exist because it's not needed or it does not exist because nobody cares. No, I think it's more because it's so diverse. You know, it just, it, the, the, the physics of every quantitative MRI aspect is different. So, you know, different parameters will matter for different fields. And I think it's going to be really tough. Brain, but to let's focus on the brain, I guess. Yeah, but do you want to focus on T1 or T2 or the cross relaxation rate or the fractional pool size or the bound pool fraction, which is related to the fractional pool size, but not the same thing, uh, or the myelin water fraction or the susceptibility map? And each of these come from a different lab with a completely different understanding of what quantitative MRI is. I think the way you're attacking it is from an fMRI perspective, where we all agree that it's the yeah. bold signal. And here right. it's not. Like here, they don't even know what it is <laughs> oftentimes. What is T1? And then that's why it's really difficult to say this is a good T1 map because there is the sequence that was used. There is the processing that was used. There was the uh, vendor that was used. Like all those things really matter. So it's more kind of like if you wanted to do this, but think of it not as fMRI bold, 
think of it as quantitative fMRI, where it's cerebral blood flows and cerebral blood volumes, and then just multiply that by 20. And that's the level at which quantitative MRI needs to be attacked. Mm -hmm. I'd love to hear other people's opinions. Sorry, I just jumped in and now I'm on my soapbox, but Julian. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I kindly disagree. <laughs> uh, I, I, I would not like, I would put fMRI in the, in the same basket. To, to me, fMRI, you know, we, we basically have like a bunch of images and we fit, we fit something. And then there is like an, like a biophysical model that you know the both signal is, is you know originates from you know like paramagnetic molecules and it changes. I I I put it in the same basket as as qMRI. But uh, would you and, say that so I would say fMRI is just one basket and quantitative MRI is 20 more baskets. Well and okay. fMRI kind of fixed it or you know is is trying to fix it, right? I, I wouldn't say that uh, this is fixed in, in fMRI. It's just that the, there, there is like a higher, um, like a, a bigger critical mass of people mm -hmm. working on that problem, right? Whereas the, there is a much smaller critical mass of people working on the on the bound pool fraction, for example. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's one and two. And so the, the 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 corollary of that is that there have been much more tools and you know and brains working on on, on those problems, you yeah. know. Yeah, no, and, that's that's fair point. I, and I agree. The second argument is that uh, I I do think that you, you know we can use like analog uh, approaches uh, for QC uh, as the one we are doing for QMR, for uh, fMRI. You know, like uh, realignment across different images is is key, and you know we can use similar approaches as uh, what what they've been doing for fMRI. Yeah. But Julian, do you agree that the solution is not going to be, uh, it's not going to be similar to the fMRI solution? That basically the solution to bound pool fraction is going to require a different kind of tool set to actually get to the level of some quality control. Can we use the same quality control tools for fMRI to fix susceptibility mapping? Well, I guess we would need to go into the, the details of what we mean by the same. Uh, but you know, the, the, in the big picture, I would say yes. You know, like there is like realignment, there is a checking for artifacts. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. susceptibility artifacts. You know, hamper the uh, you know the the the, the empty the, the empty scans as well as the uh, EPI scans. Uh, you know, B one plus B one minus noise levels. I I don't know uh, motion. Yeah. yeah, so that's that's where I come from. You know, I think we did a little bit of work towards that in the Montreal and Marathon few years ago, and I want to pursue that further. You know, as, as long as visual review helps catch artifacts, I think there is a role for good software to make that life make that easier, right? I know there are 20 baskets. What are the three popular baskets that we can focus on? Or five, you know? Mm -hmm. Just Aga sent a link, you know, showing echo flip towards empty and part. You know, these are the five collections, right? We can perhaps focus on that, you know. I think this problem of there is going to be open data sets and people are going to try to use them. And I just want some reasonable, what you call, uh, quick I think, yeah. I think the uh, most efficient way to do this is let's fix T1 mapping. I think that T1 mapping is right for fixing. It's been around for a long time. We've attacked it from different places. We have lots of data. We kind of know how to fix it. So and it's essential I, clinically too. And like it's essential G clinically. Yeah. And believe me, T1 mapping, I mean, T1 mapping in brain is broken. T1 mapping in heart is just irreparably broken. I mean, it's, it's, it's horrible. It's the worst quantitative MRI thing I've ever seen in my life. And they refuse to fix it. <laughs> <laughs> because right. they have these product sequences that they're selling. And they, I mean, it's snake oil, if you ask me. <laughs> <laughs> so T1 is fixable. I'm not sure if every basket is fixable and maybe some of the T1 tools are going to be useful. But if we could fix T1 mapping, I have hope for others. If we cannot fix T1 mapping that's been around for 50 years, as Matthew showed, <laughs> 70, uh, then, you know, what's the point? So fixing, that sounds like multifaceted issue coming from vendors selling snake oil, but uh, 
from the user side, let's say there is data already acquired, which is true with a lot of data sets now. Uh, when you say we can fix it, you mean we can fix it at the user end in terms of remapping them? I think that's uh, what it is. Yeah, sorry, uh, I had to I had to answer a question, but uh, yes, I and I mean vendors vendors need to realize that their machines are not measurement devices. They never were. Okay. They, they were not invented that way. Mm -hmm. And what Aga is doing is kind of trying to convert something that's not a measurement device into a measurement device. But I the see. benefit here is vendors don't care about quantity of MRI. It's such a small part of their profits and their sequences that I think we have some leverage with them and say, you know what? Nobody's using these things anyway. How about we show you one way that could actually make your products useful? And my vision here is like an app store. You know, like there's your hardware. It takes beautiful photos. Great for it. Let me create an app that uses those photos, but let me standardize the app rather than you blocking it in a black box. And it's a win-win. It's like Viber running on Android and iPhone. Hello, talking about black boxes, Nikolai. I think I think they are tending towards QMR, but by by making even bigger black boxes, you know, yeah. with yeah. MR fingerprinting, with uh, you know, machine learning and all these tools, yeah. where they are sending it, like selling it, like here, do QMRI in five minutes, you get so many patterns, uh, parameters, but um, you know. Is it robust? Is it good? We, we don't know. But it cannot be a black box. It must not be a black box. Yeah, I mean, I think we should probably do another uh, session slash a marathon or whatever on this. You know, I think there are some reasonable solutions to very well known problems from what I understand uh, from what Nicola describes. And I think I'm happy to help what I can. Um, and that also sounds like a good paper, Nicola, or at least a blog post, <laughs> what you've mentioned, you know? I would love to read uh, in more detail. You know, I'm not a QMR expert, but uh, want to understand why that is, so we can learn the lessons from that field and take it to other fields, you know? No, it used to be the conferences were a good place to talk about this, you know? And, and now it's kind of <laughs> like, uh, so I agree. We should be writing more. I, I really should. Uh, Maybe, maybe 2022. Uh, do, do you want to give another talk on this? Basically, like say how uh, is vendors are selling snake oil? <laughs> uh, so Pradeep, uh, I, on one hand I would, on the other- Sometime in the ne next year, yeah. I, I just, yeah, I just feel that, you know, every Zoom meeting just makes me like my job a little bit less. You know, it's just a personal kind of, you know, <laughs> problem I have. And I mean, I do many of them. I organize many of them and I appreciate what you do. But I feel like, you know, I, I, I need to find a different way to get that word across. So yes, I think it would be nice to have that discussion, but I would love to, you know, do it in a more interactive, more informal way. And I guess Zoom is the best we can do at the moment. Uh, so I, I just how can I, uh, How can we make this more interactive and more informal? Should we put some special wigs on? Or? No, I think we should just have a conference in person. You know, it's, it, it's been two years. <laughs> we should yeah, have a marathon, man. right? Like we should, we should have these yeah. things. Uh, has, uh, it, uh, yeah. has Open Science beers restarted or no? No, I mean, I can't, I can't restart yeah. it. I feel that, uh, you know, it's, it's really difficult to uh, organize something in such an uncertain climate. I mean, I go yeah, and have beers in Nelses every week with different people, but it's one-on-one. -on -one. I don't feel comfortable with a group. Uh, right. So, yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, it's gonna be a while, I think, before uh, in-person conferences. No, that's, that's true. And we need to, you know, yeah. I, I'm happy to experiment with format. And again, it might be just my fatigue. You know, I'm really, really zoomed out. Uh, yeah. And maybe at some point we fix it. Maybe we maybe we put goggles on and then it's a virtual reality. You know, it's anything <laughs> that will make me feel like I'm not staring at four blank screens and six screens with camera. You know, I I yeah. I, I think this is an important conversation, but I don't know if you know this is the most productive medium to be having it. And well, I, I think that uh, a video from Doctor Stikow just ranting out all the issues <laughs> <laughs> is. Is going to be very helpful. You are like very good at communicating what you think. And I, I know you've been doing Psycom for so long. So just a video, just outlining what you think would be very helpful. You don't have to go through this 
review your bullshit. Just say what you want. We'll put it out there <laughs> and we'll see what people think. They'll probably respond or whatnot. You know, maybe we can even put it on the HPM blog, you know. And see. I'm, I'm thinking, so I did the podcast with Peter Bandettini. I wrote a lot right. preparing for that podcast. And, and thanks for yeah. listening to it, by the way. I, I know that you had uh, nice, nice feedback. So I'm thinking yeah. of putting some of that on paper. I think that that I would feel more comfortable with. I mean, I can rant, it's fine, but I, I just, you know, I, I feel it might be counterproductive. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it's- Nah, I think I any more years. discussion is good in my opinion. More discussion is good. People just let it out. <laughs> I like blogs because I can say whatever I want, you know? Um, yeah. Anyway, cool. So I'm looking forward to um, MR, next marathon or other events where we can discuss this more and try to contribute. This has been fabulous. I learned a lot today and uh, I hope others too. I'll be sharing the video soon after uh, this is processed and ready. Thank you again, uh, Dr. Matthew Boudreau, Aga, and uh, Nicola. This is fantastic. I always enjoy talking to you guys. So yeah. And, and don't get me wrong. I really appreciate what you're doing.